recommend to you uh, uh, this book, uh, The Apostle, A Life of Paul by John Pollock. Uh, I think uh, of the several Paul biographies I've read, this one is a, a readable, accessible, and really useful one. Uh, and so if you're looking uh, to read a good uh, Paul biography, this one I would recommend to you. This time, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, James and James and James, uh, uh, and the, uh, the issue of the Jameses. So next slide, please. Uh, so the, uh, <coughs> the Jameses in the New Testament are James the son of Zebedee, who's the brother of John, James the son of Alphaeus, uh, and James the brother of Jesus, who became known in later years in the church as James the Greater, James the Lesser, or James the Less, and James the Just. And the question, of course, is how many Jameses are we talking about? Uh, down through the years, the big controversy here has been, are these three different men or two different men? And so that's the question uh, that you always confront when you start thinking about the New Testament men named James. Next slide. Uh, so <clears throat> when you think about these, uh, this is the conventional way to break up these three as, th as three men as opposed to two. That is, that James the Greater is James the son of Zebedee and the brother of John that James the Less or James the Lesser is James the son of Alphaeus, and that James the Just is James the brother of Jesus. There is uh, a tradition uh, which is still very strong in the Roman Catholic Church and in some of the church in the East that the last four names on this list are all the same man. And so that there's only two people on this list, and that James the Less is also James the Just, James the son of, Salve, of, son of Alphaeus, and James the brother of Jesus, that that is all one man. And there are many who would argue that point even today. Uh, and the, the basis for this, there's a lot of complicated uh, uh, explanations for this, but the basic idea is that uh, the son of Alphaeus, James, is actually the cousin of Jesus, because the word brother and the word cousin in Hebrew are the same. <clears throat> and so that uh, when James the brother of Jesus is actually a way of saying James the cousin of Jesus, and Alphaeus is a brother of Joseph perhaps, or somehow others, so that the uh, James would be Jesus' cousin. And one of the big drivers behind that argument, by the way, is the need uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition to maintain the perpetual virginity of Mary, and therefore to explain how it is that Jesus has four brothers, uh, as twice noted in the Gospels, uh, and that uh, the, the four brothers that Jesus is listed as having in both Matthew 13 and Mark 6, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, where do they come from? And who are they? Uh, so if you believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, that is that Joseph and Mary were married, Mary gave birth to Jesus, and then that their marriage was never consummated after that, and this is, a, this is a, uh, a belief that is pretty strong today in the Roman Catholic Church and, uh, and has roots that go back fairly early in Christianity, making Mary some uh, a particularly holy person, uh, a perpetual virgin, uh, then you have to come up with a way that these four guys and their sisters, uh, traditionally two sisters, um, uh, where do they come from? And so uh, the explanations uh, that are offered, of course, are uh, one, that Joseph was much older than Mary, and he had previously been married and had six children with his first wife, and then she died, and then he married Mary, and that he was in his 40s or older when he married Mary, uh, and so Joseph died while well, Jesus was young, uh, and this is one reason why uh, he and Mary never had any children together. 
So that's one explanation uh, that's offered. Another explanation, of course, is that these four guys are not Jesus' brothers, but they are his cousins. Uh, so this is an issue both with the issue of the James and James and James, and also the follow-on issue, which is the issue of Judas and Judas and Judas, uh, because there are three men named Judas, and one of them is on this list of brothers of Jesus. Uh, so the brothers of Jesus uh, in Matthew 12 and John chapter 7 seem to be unbelievers. They act as unbelievers. They act as people who believe that what Jesus is doing isn't particularly real. Uh, they act as if maybe they think he uh, is out of his mind or at least that he is not doing the thing that God is doing, that he is not the Son of God, but that he is a guy who is deluding himself in some way. Uh, John 2 uh, indicates that, uh, that the brothers of Jesus were present and followed along with some of the early things that Jesus did. Uh, and in Acts 1.14, when you see the group uh, after the ascension gathered together, it says uh, the twelve and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And so it appears that at least a couple of his brothers were around the edge of the ministry, perhaps very skeptical, and that after the resurrection they were converted to the faith. And we see both James and Judas having some significant role in the church after that. So my argument is going to be that there are three men named James here and not two. And that's basically the Protestant argument that James the son of Alphaeus and James the brother of Jesus are different people and that James the brother of Jesus is truly his brother, his half-brother in the sense that he is the child of Mary. On the Protestant side, we typically believe, uh, most Protestants believe, that Mary and Joseph had six, at least six other children after Jesus was born. That they had a, a normal marriage, if you will, um, and that, uh, that there were six other boys and at least two girls that were born to Mary over the course of her life. Uh, and this, of course, aligns reasonably well with our understanding that Mary was very young at the time uh, that she became the mother of Jesus. So, uh, so those, are, those are a few bigger things to be thinking about when we think about James and James and James. Now, James, the son of Zebedee and brother of John, is one of the twelve. He's the fisherman from Galilee, and he becomes known as James the Greater down through the ages. James, the son of Alphaeus, is also one of the twelve. And he's the one who is always listed first of the last four of the twelve disciples, on the four lists of the twelve disciples. They're always in three groups of four, and James, the son of Alphaeus, is always the first of the last four. Um, and so James the less, or James the lesser, um, that doesn't actually mean, that's not a dig at him, probably. He's probably the less or the lesser because he was either shorter or he was younger. And in that culture, both of those things would have made him lesser than the other James. Uh, and so uh, the likelihood is there that that's a comment about who is taller or who is older um, and not who was more significant. Um, and James, the brother of Jesus, of course, becomes known as James the Just because of his life. Uh, and we'll take a look at that. So next slide. Uh, let's start with James the Just. Uh, uh, Matthew 13, Mark 6, and Galatians 1 all say that James the Just uh, was the brother of Jesus. Uh, and author, uh, this is the author of the epistle of James, as we believe. Uh, this particular image is a, a restored Byzantine icon that, uh, that has roots very early on uh, 
in the third or fourth century, something like that, but has been much more recently restored so that you can see what it potentially looked like back then. Uh, <clears throat> so the question about the brother of the Lord. Uh, so there is, uh, Protestants tend to believe that he is the half-brother, that he is a younger child of Joseph and Mary. Uh, uh, the Eastern Orthodox and some Roman Catholics believe that he is the step-brother of Jesus, that is, he is a child of Joseph from a previous marriage. Um, and there is no word for cousin in Aramaic or Hebrew, so, so it's possible here that he is a cousin, and there's a, the, the explanations for that get complicated pretty quickly, um, but, uh, but there is some belief that he is the son of Joseph's brother Clopas, uh, we, there is a Clopas who is part of this story, uh, and Eusebius asserts that he was the brother of Joseph. There's no other evidence for that, but there is a lot of tradition that is sprung from that idea. Or <clears throat> that, he, uh, uh, that James is the son of Mary's sister who married Clopas. Jerome says that, um, and the many Roman Catholics believe that. Um, the people who believe that James is the son of Mary's sister almost always believe that Mary's sister was also named Mary. So that's a pretty serious failure of imagination on the part of somebody's mom when you name two of your daughters Mary. Now, personally, my great-grandfather named two of his sons Hans, but one of them died in infancy, and so the second one was uh, born some years after the first one had died. In this case, the argument is that, uh, that this family had two daughters that were both named Mary, and they both grew up to be adults and lived overlapping lives. Um, that seems a little complicated um, and a little unlikely. Um, Clement of Alexandria, uh, who was born around 150 AD and lived to about 215, uh, said, this James, whom the people of old called the just because of his outstanding virtue, was the first, as the record tells us, to be elected to the Episcopal throne of the Jerusalem church. James is the first leader of the church in Jerusalem, so it would appear and probably became the leader of the church in Jerusalem long before the term bishop was in any kind of widespread use. Um, so uh, James appears in the book of Acts to be the clear leader of the church in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 15, when they gather the first uh, Jerusalem council, it is James who seems to be the leader of that group. It is interesting that, uh, that Paul speaks, and then Peter speaks, and then James speaks in the narration in Acts chapter 15. And when James speaks, James says, it is my judgment. And when you read that, it sounds rather like a ruling. It sounds rather like James is actually saying, so this is what? It is my judgment. I'm passing judgment. I'm speaking that this is the answer. And, and once he says that, everybody else agrees. And so James is functioning as at least the chairman of the meeting and potentially the leader of the church in that. Uh, his apparent ruling is immediately accepted by all. When Peter is re miraculously re released from prison in Acts chapter 12, after James has been uh, murdered by Herod, um, Peter goes to report back to the church and asks that they inform James about what has happened. And then he goes off into hiding for a period. When Paul writes... Uh, in Galatians chapter 2, about his first trip back to Jerusalem, he says he spoke to James and Peter and John because they seem to be the pillars, he says, of the church in that place. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 
Paul said, says that James is one of those that the risen Christ appeared to. This is one of the reasons why many uh, believe James the just to be an apostle. And he writes the book of James, and Jesus appeared to him personally, the risen Jesus did. Um, and in Acts chapter 21, when Paul returns to Jerusalem uh, with the big offering from the churches, it is James that he reports to. It is James that he brings the offering to, and it is James who says there are rumors that you have abandoned all, thing, all the aspects of your Judaism, and I have a plan for how we can establish that you have not done that. So you will go up to the temple for a week and engage in this ritual of pur purification, which Paul immediately agrees to, and Paul goes up to the temple, and before the end of the week, there's a riot, and he is accused and arrested uh, and ends up on the beginning of his long trip to Rome. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, when Paul makes the, uh, the, the difference between himself and other apostles and names Peter, Peter takes his wife with him. I don't do that. I am never a burden to you. He says, he implies that Peter and maybe James are also married. So it is possible that James is a married man. There's no other indication of that. Um, why is he called James the Just? Apparently he lived a, a fairly ascetic life. Um, there is some possibility that he lived under the Nazarite vow, uh, as did John the Baptist and a number of figures in the Old Testament. Um, Apparently, he was hugely respected in Jerusalem uh, for his piety, for his wisdom, for his practice, his worship. Um, and he seems to have remained in Jerusalem through, from the time of the resurrection, all the way through his death. He, James is not associated with ministry in any other place. Uh, so it appears that he early on became the head of the church in Jerusalem, and he remained there, uh, or at least remained in that area. Um, and in this time, Jerusalem was convulsed by all kinds of different trouble, uh, and increasingly so from about A.D. 44. So a decade or so after the resurrection, Jerusalem becomes increasingly convulsed by trouble and issues and uproar leading to uh, uh, a revolt against the Romans that begins a siege in A.D. 66 that ends up in the destruction of the city and the temple in A.D. 70. Uh, so uh, there's the issue uh, uh, chronicled in the book of Acts of this man uh, Theudas uh, who brought uh, a whole bunch of people out of Jerusalem and told them that he was going to take them down uh, to the Jordan River and he was going to part the waters and they were going to march across together, kind of backwards from what Joshua did, uh, and that uh, they were going to find great glory on the other side. Uh, there is the uh, Egyptian who brought uh, a group of revolutionaries out of the wilderness uh, to the Mount of Olives, telling them that he had a secret way into the city. Both of those were uh, put down by the Roman army. Uh, Josephus, uh, the Jewish historian, uh, uh, records that, uh, that at one Passover in this time, uh, there was a riot uh, after a Roman soldier on guard duty outside the, the temple uh, made an obscene gesture uh, towards people uh, that led to a rioting and a stampede, and as people pressed for the exits of the temple, trying to get away from whatever it was that was happening, uh, that there were, Josephus claims, 30,000 people killed, crushed, and suffocated. 30,000 seems like a lot, but some kind of gigantic uproar certainly did happen at that time that led to uh, the deaths of very many people. Uh, Josephus also records conflict between the priests, the chief priests at the temple, and the local priests that served the city and the surrounding area. Uh, 
that led to open conflict between these two groups and that they hired these two groups of priests, each hired armed men to represent them and to engage in some combat uh, between each other and that the local priests in some cases died of starvation because the chief priests had managed uh, to take control of the food supply. Uh, and this may have influenced some of the words that James has to say in James chapter 5 about the treatment of the poor by the rich. So uh, there were increasingly during the latter part of James's lifetime more of these attacks by the Sicarii, uh, the knife men uh, who tended to knife people in the street. Uh, a former high priest named Jonathan had his throat slit in a crowded street in the middle of the day uh, during this period. Um, uh, Felix, uh, the man that Paul was originally imprisoned under, uh, the Roman uh, uh, representative, uh, imposed better order in the sense that he executed many people, but his repression and his heavy-handedness stirred up more and more resistance uh, during that time, and he was removed and replaced by Porcius Festus about A.D. 59. Uh, and so uh, that happened relatively late in James's life uh, and well into his uh, ministry. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so this is a quote from uh, uh, Hegesippus, uh, whose, whose life we don't know very much about. He's the earliest known chronicler of the church after the book of Acts, and his chronicle is entirely lost except for the parts that Eusebius quotes. Eusebius quotes from him a bunch, and so we know a bunch of things that Hesychippus said, uh, but we only have a general idea of when he lived or anything else about him. His writings uh, apparently existed, reputedly existed in monasteries in the East, uh, uh, that is in places like uh, Ethiopia and Mesopotamia, uh, up into the 16th or 17th century. There are people in those eras who traveled to those places who report having read Hegesippus in those places. But there is no existing uh, copies of his writings available today. But this is one of the things that Hegesippus, uh, quoted by Eusebius, says about James. James the Just. James the brother of the Lord, surnamed the Just, was made head of the church at Jerusalem. Many indeed are called James. This one was holy from his mother's womb. He drank neither wine nor strong drink, ate no flesh, never shaved, or anointed himself with ointment or bathed. He alone had the privilege of entering the Holy of Holies, since indeed he did not use wool investments but linen, and went alone into the temple and prayed on behalf of the people, insomuch that his knees were reputed to have acquired the hardness of camel's knees. There's a couple of things that are interesting about this. First of all, the description in the, uh, the second quarter of this is very much that of the Nazarite vow, uh, the behaviors that go with that, that are also practiced by John the Baptist in the New Testament era. Um, but the privilege of entering the Holy of Holies was limited to the high priest. And James was never the high priest. So if Hegesippus is right, then for some reason James became seen as having a level of holiness that put him at the level of the high priest which seems a little unlikely politically, but could be true, um, but if he entered the Holy of Holies, it was because he was viewed as having that level of standing in the society. Um, it is, certainly seems true uh, that he was a very prayerful and pious man who was greatly respected and who lived a very ascetic life, who who lived a life of prayer and service and very little else. Um, so, uh, so James dies, uh, 
And there is a variety of different things, next slide here, <clears throat> that have to do with James's death. This is a, uh, uh, a fairly old depiction of the story as it's related by Eusebius um, and, and is fairly parallel to what Josephus also says. So uh, it is generally believed that James was thrown from the parapet of the temple, that he was uh, brought up by some means to, uh, to the roof of the temple in Jerusalem uh, and thrown from the parapet and he did not die uh, from the fall and that he was subsequently stoned by uh, some in the crowd uh, and then maybe in an act of mercy and maybe just in an act of anger, a man uh, who was employed uh, as a fuller, that is a man who beaded out cloth in an area immediately adjacent to the temple, entered the temple courts and beat him to death with his club. Uh, uh, and that this happened, uh, Hesychippus says this happened in A.D. 62. Clement of Alexandria, who uh, lived between 150 and about 215, uh, and is quoted in Eusebius, also agrees that this happened about A.D. 262. Uh, Eusebius later implies that this happened in A.D. 65 or 66, and that it was right at the beginning or just before the Roman siege of the city began. Eusebius says that the Roman siege of the city was actually a punishment on the city because of the murder of James the Just. Um, and there are other uh, ancient sources that say that James was killed in about AD 69, very late in the siege, uh, but before uh, the Romans entered the city. Um, Josephus says uh, that what really happened here is that there was a gap in the Roman procurators when Porcius Festus died in AD 62. Uh, that Festus died in office and was not immediately replaced and that while they were waiting for his replacement to arrive, the high priest Ananus or Annas II uh, was able to get the Sanhedrin to agree to condemn James for breaking the law and then to stone him for, to death, um, uh, an act uh, which Josephus said led to a delegation being sent to the new Roman procurator even before he arrived to appeal to him to, for justice on behalf of James uh, because he was regarded as a holy man and that the new procurator, even before he got to Jerusalem, replaced Ananus as the high priest, and that Ananus served less than six months in that role, um, and that that's why. Um, Eusebius has a much longer uh, story here, and that story is depicted on this slide. On the left-hand side, Eusebius, uh, and this is clearly from Eusebius's chronicle here, but on the left hand side you see the priests telling James that it is necessary that he speak to the people about this matter of this man Jesus and inviting him to go up to speak from the top of the temple so that many would be able to see him in the largest crowd possible would be able to hear him. And that they did this as a conspiracy to try to get James to say something that they could condemn him for publicly. And that James went up to the parapet of the temple to stand on the edge of the roof up there uh, and to speak to the crowd. And his words were very well received. And the priests realized that they had done a foolish thing in giving him this public place to speak from. And so several of them went up there and pushed him over the edge. And that he fell but did not die. And so some came to stone him, but few wanted to be part of that because he was viewed as such a holy man. And that he had gotten up to his knees and begun to pray for those who were seeking to kill him, in many ways like what Stephen had done when he was martyred, uh, and that the man with the fuller's club eventually came in uh, 
and quite literally beat his brains in, in the sense that uh, Eusebius uh, is among those ancient sources who says that uh, James's brains were spilled out on the pavement uh, as a result of this. And then he was, uh, his, Eusebius says, and some other ancient sources say, that he was buried either in the temple court or immediately adjacent to the temple. It was fairly common at the time to bury somebody close to where they died and to not carry a dead body for a long distance to some far away cemetery, uh, but instead to use the tomb or the burial spot that was immediately available. Very unlikely that anyone would be buried in the temple court, uh, but the, the ancient sources that assert that are ones that say that James was such a holy man and so widely respected that there's a special exception for him. Um, others believe that he was potentially buried just outside the temple in some kind of a tomb that was very close at hand. Um, uh, it is believed by some, uh, by some ancient sources, that uh, shortly before the siege of Jerusalem, a large group of Christians left Jerusalem knowing that the Roman army was coming and that the siege would be potentially terrible and disastrous for the city, and relocated the Christian church ministry from Jerusalem uh, to the city of Pella, um, and that they may have taken with them the bones of James the Just. If that is true, it's the earliest point in the history of the church where we see Christians treating the relics of a deceased saint, uh, a, a martyr of the church, uh, with some veneration uh, and, and treating that as significant. So anyway, so those are some things about James the Just, uh, the brother of Jesus. Uh, and, and there's it is possible that one of the reasons that he became the head of the church in Jerusalem is that he was the brother of Jesus. He is the first on the list of the four brothers of Jesus. In each of the times that we see that list, he is listed first, and that would make him almost certainly the eldest, because that's the standard of the era, was that you listed uh, the, the sons or the brothers by age. Um, it is also possible that he was appointed to that position because Peter and the other 11 desired to be able to go forth and carry the ministry to many other places, so it was necessary to name somebody else as the head of the local church in Jerusalem. Um, so, but those are some things about James the Just. So next slide. So James the Greater. Uh, so James the Greater is the son of Zebedee and the brother of John, one of the twelve, and the first of the uh, martyr of the apostles. Uh, the pictures here uh, on the left, this is the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostelo in Galicia, in northwestern Spain, <clears throat> which claims to hold most of the relics of James the Greater. Now, the story that they tell for how they ended up in northwestern Spain is really complicated and fantastical um, and generally involves a, uh, a ship which may or may not have been made of stone which navigated itself across the Mediterranean Sea uh, with the bones of James. So um, in any case, that cathedral is the point, the ending point, for one of the great pilgrimages of the Christian world that has been ongoing since the medieval times. And it's based around the idea that this is the place that you go to see James, James the Greater. Uh, the lower right photo is uh, the inside of the Armenian Apostolic Cathedral of St. James in Jerusalem, uh, which believes that it is built on the spot that James was killed. That, that when James was murdered by Herod, uh, that uh, executed by Herod, uh, that this is the spot on which that happened. And the Armenian Apostolic Cathedral of St. James in Jerusalem believes that underneath their altar is the head of James the Greater. 
So, and then the upper right there is uh, uh, Guido Reni uh, in the early 1600s, a uh, portrait that he did uh, about James the Greater in any case. So James the Greater, probably meaning older or taller, one of the 12, uh, one of the Sons of Thunder. Uh, and as I uh, mentioned last week, the Sons of Thunder may be a little bit more mocking or chiding than it is uh, uh, you know, some statement of great power, uh, but he was a fisherman from Galilee. He's one of the three that was chosen to be at the Transfiguration. He's one of the three that Jesus took with him to pray at Gethsemane. He's martyred by Herod Agrippa I. Acts 12, 2 says he was martyred by the sword. Uh, uh, so unclear as to whether, you know, he was stabbed or his head was cut off. Uh, but, uh, but the timing of this is generally agreed to have been in A.D. 44, so a decade after the resurrection, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and there's an interesting thing that happens in, J in Acts chapter 12 here with James and Peter. Herod arrests James and executes him. Herod arrests Peter, and Peter angels come and miraculously release him from prison. And so God chooses that James becomes an early martyr and Peter does not. So uh, Eusebius quotes uh, Clement of Alexandria uh, saying that James was beheaded uh, and Clement uh, tells the story that the accuser of James, the one who functionally betrayed him to Herod, um, uh, was converted as James made his defense in front of Herod uh, and chose to be martyred with him. Uh, Herod Agrippa I uh, is the guy that that had James killed, he is the guy uh, that subsequently was eaten by worms. Uh, that is chronically briefly in Acts and at much greater length by Josephus, who uh, takes some delight uh, in telling that particular story. Um, so, uh, the uh, Santiago de Compostela in Galicia uh, is at the end of something called the Camino de Santiago. Uh, uh, which is, has been the most popular pilgrimage route in Europe since the Middle Ages. Uh, it, was, it had fallen into some disuse uh, by the late 70s, early 80s, but uh, a book had been published around that time about it, uh, which made it famous again. Um, more than 300,000 people walked the Camino de Santiago, which starts in southern France and uh, goes across northern Spain uh, in 2018. Rick Steves, uh, your PBS travel guy, has made the Camino de Santiago and done a story about it. Uh, Martin Sheen uh, has starred in a movie that was set in the Camino de Santiago. This is the walk of James the Great. Uh, not that James the Great ever was there or walked it, but people do that in honor of James the Greater. Uh, there's no ev real evidence that he ever traveled to Spain or even that he really left Jerusalem for any reason in the decade after the resurrection. Um, but he is a cultural icon in northern Spain. And thousands of people from all over the world go there in honor of James the Greater, uh, even today. Well, not this year, probably hardly anybody is doing that, but uh, uh, in the last few years, this has been a very uh, famous and common thing. Uh, so that's James the Greater, brother of John, uh, son of Zebedee, uh, one of the sons of thunder. Uh, so next slide. So James the Less, James the son of Alphaeus. Uh, uh, the left-hand uh, one is a, uh, uh, is a portrait done by Rubens uh, between about 1610 and 1612. Uh, it's in the Prado Museum in Spain. Uh, and the, uh, 
sculpture at the upper right is by Angelo Rossi and done between about 1705 and 1711. Uh, and it's in the Cathedral of St. John Lateran in Rome, and that's the cathedral in the middle there. Um, so this is James, the son of Alphaeus, last meaning probably shorter or younger. He's one of the 12 and always listed first in the third group of four. Uh, in the New Testament, he appears only in the four lists of the 12. That's it. The four times that the 12 are listed, you get James, the son of Alphaeus. And that's the only time he appears in the New Testament. Mark 2.14 has Levi the publican as the son of Alphaeus. And that same story is told in Matthew chapter 9 with Matthew the publican, but which does not say he was the son of Alphaeus. So there's a possibility that James, the son of Alphaeus, and Matthew were brothers. And that doesn't seem super likely to me because the New Testament makes clear that Peter and Andrew are brothers and that James and John are brothers. And so why if James and Matthew were brothers, you would think that that would also be noted, and particularly that Matthew would note that if one of the other 12, one of the other of the 12 was, one, was his brother, uh, you would think Matthew would find that noteworthy. Uh, publican, by the way, uh, a lot of people think of publican today as somebody who runs a bar or a public house or something, but publican meant uh, a supervisor of tax collectors uh, at the time. Uh, so a collaborator with the Romans. Um, so uh, uh, James the Last might be the son of Mary, the mother of James, uh, both in Matthew 27 at the end of that chapter and in Mark 15, uh, there is a Mary, the mother of James, who appears at uh, the crucifixion. Um, uh, that's also in Mark 16 and Luke 24. Um, and John 19 has a Mary of Clopas, which is either Clopas a place or more likely uh, the Mary who is married to Clopas, uh, who is also associated with this story um, and who follows Jesus all the way to the cross. Um, and so if, uh, if that's true, he, maybe he's a cousin of Jesus. So uh, James is probably from Capernaum, uh, and it's possible that he would have met Jesus at the feast that Matthew gave when Matthew uh, joined, uh, first joined Jesus' ministry, uh, when Matthew finds salvation despite the fact that he is a tax collector. Uh, there is some possibility that James, son of Alphaeus, that even if he and Matthew were brothers or friends or closely related in some way, would have been at odds, at least until they both became uh, called as disciples of Jesus because of Matthew's tax collecting. Uh, Matthew's being called Levi in some contexts makes it possible that he was part of the tribe of Levi. The name Levi was seldom used at that time by people who were not descended from the tribe of Levi. And the tribe of Levi, of course, has responsibility uh, for uh, uh, the priesthood and for the care of the temple. And so somebody who came out of that tribe and chose to collaborate with the Romans would be seen as a double traitor, uh, if that were true. Uh, so. Uh, there's a uh, collection of lives of the saints that was published around 1275 called The Golden Legend, uh, the sources of which are not entirely uh, known. Uh, but The Golden Legend says that James looks so much like Jesus that Judas Iscariot, when he came to betray Jesus, said, look, just so you can make sure you get the right guy, I'm going to go kiss him so you'll know because in the dark you could easily get him confused with James the son of Alphaeus who looks pretty much the same. So that might be true. That uh, influenced, or at least the story that that comes from, 
influences apparently a bunch of the early art depicting the 12. Because in the early art depicting the 12, James the son of Alphaeus is depicted as the really good looking one. And that probably comes from artists believing that he looked like Jesus. Um, Isaiah 53 notwithstanding, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the comments there that Isaiah has about the, uh, uh, the coming Messiah would not be you know, fabulously good looking, uh, but, uh, but that appears to have influenced depictions of James the Less, uh, the idea that somehow he looked like Jesus and maybe if he was a cousin, perhaps that's true. Uh, it is possible that James was the first bishop of the church in Syria uh, and that he spent a good bit of time uh, in his ministry in Damascus. Um, there are uh, a variety of different traditions about uh, what happened to him later in life. Uh, there is at least some tradition that he went to Egypt uh, and went up the Nile and was crucified at some point. Uh, Hippolytus of Rome, uh, uh, who lived from about 170 to 235 AD, says that James was stoned in Jerusalem uh, at some point. And this has led to a lot of back and forth and confusion because uh, James the Just, if he was tossed from the temple and then stoned and then beaten to death with a fuller's club, a guy who was also named James who was stoned in Jerusalem, it's easy to see that maybe those two events are the same. Uh, but Hippolytus believes that, that two guys named James were both stoned in Jerusalem under very different circumstances and that James the last, James the son of Alphaeus, uh, was just stoned. He wasn't thrown off of anything or beaten or any of that. Um, nothing else can be known with any certainty about the ministry of James the son of Alphaeus. Um, the Emperor Justinian, ruling in Constantinople between 527 and 565, believed that he had removed the body of James the son of Alphaeus from Jerusalem at that time. Uh, he was a relic hunter, a looker for uh, things that were associated with the apostles in the apostolic era, uh, and he believed that he had recovered the bones of James the son of Alphaeus uh, and then sent them uh, in the 570s. Uh, so, uh, they were sent shortly after Justinian's death. Uh, they were sent to Rome and interred in the Church of the Holy Apostles, which was originally dedicated in May 560. And the Church of the Holy Apostles in Rome contends that they have the set of bones that belong to James, the son of Alphaeus. Um, so, so those are three men named James that we see among the apostles. So, next slide. <clears throat> so, what about Judas and Judas and Judas? So, we've got three men named Judas, or two men named Judas, depending on how you think about this. Uh, but there is Judas, the son of James, who is also known as Thaddeus. And on the four lists of the 12 apostles, he is twice known as Thaddeus, and twice known as Judas, the son of James. And there's Judas Iscariot, who is always listed last on the list, the four lists of the 12 apostles, and it is always specified that he betrayed Jesus. Uh, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Uh, and that is actually the way his name is rather presented on those lists. Uh, and then there is Judas, or Jude, the writer of the epistle of Jude and the brother of Jesus, who is always listed last on the two lists of the four brothers of Jesus. That is, he's the youngest. So Judah, <clears throat> the name Judah, which is very important in Jewish history, was at this time the most popular boy's name in the Jewish world, partially because uh, of the heroic actions of Judas Maccabeus, uh, 
uh, some hundreds of years before in leading the, ro uh, the revolt against the Greeks um, uh, that led to uh, uh, the first and second Maccabees uh, uh, and uh, uh, in Jewish practices today uh, uh, that, uh, that lived down through the ages. Um, but Judah uh, is Judas in Greek and Jude in Latin. So those are all the same name in different languages. So Judas, son of James, uh, uh, actually has uh, uh, a brief uh, part here in uh, Luke chapter 6 uh, and asks a question in John 14, which is in John's chronicle, is the last question that's asked by one of the disciples of Jesus. John 14, 22. Um, Thaddeus uh, is probably a nickname. Thaddeus means close to the heart or something like that, uh, a man of the heart. Uh, and Matthew and Mark both use this term Thaddeus. Uh, and so Matthew and Mark, having got his information from Peter, those are two guys who were of the 12 who were writing. Uh, and uh, Matthew also calls him Lebaeus, uh, which may be a Greek-derived term that means basically the same thing uh, in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, so it, it's possible that Thaddeus and Lebaeus were a later nickname that was given to Judas, the son of James, partly because going around and introducing yourself as Judas after the betrayal of Judas Iscariot was getting to be uh, a little bit problematic. Um, so, uh, so it's possible that, that became a nickname or just a name that he used uh, partly to get away from uh, any association with Judas Iscariot. Um, and uh, when Judas asks his question in John chapter 14, John is careful to say, Judas not Iscariot uh, in that passage. Um, so Judas, son of James, who's James? Well, it's possible that we just don't know who James is, that James is a reasonably common name, uh, but we've just spent time thinking about three men named James. Uh, for those that want to make a connection, the connection that they make is that James the Greater, James the son of Zebedee, James the brother of John, was significantly older than John, and that Judas, son of James, was his son. And that in the 12, you have a father-son pair with James the Greater and Judas, the son of James. And that the reason why he's called Judas, the son of James, is because there's a James that he's the son of that's right there. I think that's problematic here uh, because uh, when the mother of James and John intercedes on their behalf that they might sit at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in his glory, that means that she's interceding on behalf of her two sons and ignoring her grandson, who is also one of the twelve. Now, I'm not a huge expert on grandmothers, but I'm not sure that I buy that that would be the way that that would go. So, um, so I'm not I'm not very much in the mindset of uh, Judas, son of James, is the son of James, uh, one of the twelve. Uh, the timeline doesn't seem to me to fit very well. Um, Matthew chapter 10, uh, Judas, the son of James, is known as Judas the Zealot. Um, and so that places him with Simon the Zealot as guys who came out of the revolutionary side of the Jewish world at the time and probably were disciples of John the Baptist, who seems to have attracted a number of men uh, who were zealots. Uh, so uh, so uh, Judas, son of James, is associated with later works in, the, in Syria. Uh, he is very strongly attested by ancient sources as having had involvement in the church at Edessa. Uh, we talked about Edessa a few weeks ago. Um, 
And he is regarded down through the ages and today uh, as the founder of the church in Armenia, uh, sometimes as a co-founder with Bartholomew. Uh, when did he die? Well, there's a whole bunch of stories. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the tradition in the Armenian church is that he was killed at a place called Ardaz uh, in Armenia in about A.D. 50. Um, and buried at a place called Kara Kalisia, which is now in Iran, up near the Caspian Sea. Uh, and he is regarded as the first patriarch of the Armenian church. Uh, and uh, warfare uh, coming down out of uh, Central Asia uh, is alleged to have caused his uh, body or his bones to have been taken later to Rome. Uh, and held in Rome with those of Simon the Zealot uh, in the Church of the Apostles there. Uh, in Armenia and some other places, uh, a symbol of Judas, son of James, is an axe uh, in early art. Uh, so that may have been possibly because of the way that he died. Uh, the problem with that is AD 50 is awfully early for him to have died, and A.D. 50 is about the time of the council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, and Luke's chronicle indicates that maybe all the apostles were there. So, um, so that seems a little early. Uh, there's a tradition that comes uh, from Hippolytus, among others, uh, that uh, Judas, son of James, died in Beirut in Lebanon in about A.D. 65. And then he might have died of natural causes or just of some disease. Um, and there's some later tradition that says uh, Judas, son of James, having ministered for a long period of time in Armenia and the northern parts of the Parthian Empire and into North Persia, returned to Edessa and Abgar the fifth, uh, who is the guy that had the alleged correspondence with Jesus that we talked about a couple of sessions ago, uh, that his son Abgar the sixth had succeeded him and had turned away from the church, and that when Judas, son of James, Thaddeus returned to Edessa in A.D. 72, uh, that Abgar the sixth, son of Abgar the fifth, had him crucified. So none of those can be true, can be proven, uh, but those are the stories that go with Judas, son of James, known also as Thaddeus or Labaeus. Judas Iscariot, uh, who is listed as, uh, once as the son of Simon, uh, as the name Iscariot, uh, for some reason, it means something. There's been a lot of poking at that. The most likely is that he was from Kerioth, uh, a town in southern Judea that, uh, uh, that is listed uh, in Joshua chapter 15, and it means the man of Kerioth. Uh, one of the reasons why that seems likely to be true is uh, Judas Iscariot was the only Judean in the 12. The other 11 were all certainly Galileans or probably Galileans. And so he was an outsider. And so it would be pretty easy for them to think of him differently and to call him, refer to him by a name that related to the fact that he was from what to them was a far away place. Um, so uh, John, in John chapter 12, uh, says Judas Iscariot was the man who kept the money bag. Uh, there is some tradition that he had some background in business and he was good with money, but John says, uh, that, uh, that he believes that Judas Iscariot was actually stealing from the money bag. That's why he kept it, because he could skim, uh, skim it for his own purposes. Um, he seems to have been, of the 12, the most committed to the idea that Jesus would rule in earthly kingdom, and the most disappointed that that did not uh, turn out to be the case. Um, after he betrayed Jesus, uh, Matthew 27 says he returned the 30 pieces of silver, flung them back into the temple when the priest did not want to take them back, uh, and went out and hung himself. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 18, uh, uh, Peter reports uh, 
that Judas, uh, having realized the horrible thing that he had done, uh, went and fell headlong and his bowels burst asunder, his bowels burst open. Uh, so when you look for imagery about the, uh, the suicide or the death of Judas Iscariot, uh, you find a lot of depictions of him hanging in a more, in a fairly modern way, you know, a hangman's noose, like in a Western uh, kind of a thing. Um, and, but with his bowels, his uh, uh, bursting out of him for some reason, uh, uh, and a variety of explanations for why that might be true. Um, I think what may have happened is, you know, when I look at these, these hanging things with the hangman's noose, I tend to think that that's a, uh, a much later imposition. Uh, uh, there's not much evidence that two millennia ago that was a thing that people used as a way to kill somebody much. Uh, that seems to have been a later innovation uh, so I'm skeptical personally about he hung himself is, de is aligned with what we think of today as hanging yourself. Um, and so uh, my thought about this is that he went out uh, and flung himself uh, forward onto something where he was impaled uh, on a sharp part of a tree, uh, uh, part of a tree stump or a broken limb or something, uh, but that he fell headlong and was impaled and was left hanging on part of a tree. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, for me, that fits for what might have happened. Uh, I don't know that it's widely held, but that's my personal uh, way of thinking about that. Uh, the, uh, the 30 pieces of silver were, of course, uh, used to buy the field of blood, the Akeldama. Uh, and there is now uh, the Greek convent of uh, St. Uh, Onofruis uh, in the Hinnom Valley, outside of, uh, just outside of the ancient walls of Jerusalem, down in the valley, uh, which claims to be built on the field of blood, on the place that was purchased uh, and uh, uh, with the money, the 30 pieces of silver. Um, so the Hinnom Valley, of course, is actually uh, kind of scenic and pretty. Uh, it's really surrounded by the city now. Uh, but in the Old Testament, it's where the worshipers of Molech went to burn their children alive. And so uh, the field of blood ends up in that same place. Judas Iscariot, his motivations and responsibility for what he did remain a point of fascination and debate down through the ages. Why did he do what he did? And is he fully responsible? These are points that people continue to debate today. Uh, uh, we believe that, yes, he is fully responsible. It's his sin. Uh, but he did it because God willed it. So... Uh, anyway, that's a, but there's a longer discussion. Jude, the brother of Jesus, is the third uh, Judas here. Uh, he shows up in Mark 6 and Matthew 13 when the four brothers of Jesus are listed. Uh, and then, you know, Jude 1, um, uh, the first verse of Jude. Uh, he identifies himself in Jude 1 as the author of the epistle as a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. And it is long believed that he means James the Just. Uh, and so uh, that those are the oldest and the youngest of the four brothers on those two lists in Mark 6 and Matthew 13 of the brothers of Jesus. Um, uh, a writer in the 14th century uh, makes Jude, uh, the brother of Jesus, the bridegroom at the wedding in Cana. Okay. Uh, his ministry is associated with Judea and Samaria in Mesopotamia, but Jude is written to all Christians everywhere. The interesting thing about Jude, however, is that his descendants remained important in the church in Jerusalem through the next three generations. Next slide. So uh, back to uh, our man Hegesippus uh, and his chronicle is quoted in Eusebius. Uh, uh, 
Uh, Jude, the brother of James, is perhaps the only apostle, and uh, it's not certain that he was actually considered an apostle, uh, but the only one of this group uh, for which we have specific evidence of descendants. Uh, when Domitian, uh, uh, who reigned from uh, 81 to 96, was the emperor of Rome, uh, he commanded that all the descendants of David the king should be slain. Uh, uh, because he was worried in the same way that Herod the Great was worried that there would be some heir to David who would arise. Um, and uh, ancient tradition says some uh, heretics from the faith brought accusation against descendants of Jude uh, uh, because he was considered to be a brother of Jesus uh, on the ground that they were of the lineage of David and were therefore uh, and were related to Jesus himself. Uh, and so this is what Hegesippus says. Uh, of the family of the Lord, there were still living the grandchildren of Jude, other places he says two grandsons, uh, who is said to have been the Lord's brother according to the flesh. Information was given that they belonged to the family of David, and they were brought to the emperor Domitian by the Evocatus, for Domitian feared the coming of Christ, and Herod had also feared it. And he asked them if they were descendants of David, and they confessed that they were. Then he asked them how much property they had and how much money they owned, and both of them answered that they had only 9,000 denarii, half of which belonged to each of them, and this property did not consist of silver, but of a piece of land which contained only 39 acres, and from which they raised their taxes and supported themselves by their own labor. labor. Uh, Eusebius says they showed him their hands and exhibiting the hardness of their bodies in the calluses on their hands, uh, 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 Domitian uh, concluded that they were laborers and that they were no threat to him politically uh, when they were asked uh, concerning Jesus and the kingdom of God. Uh, they said it was not a temporal or an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly and angelic uh, ki kingdom which would appear at the end of the world uh, when Jesus would return in glory to judge the quick and the dead and to give to everyone according to his works. Uh, Domitian despised them as of no account and let them go and put a stop to further persecution of descendants of David. Uh, uh, when they were released, uh, Eusebius says uh, they... Uh, were uh, continued to be treated as witnesses uh, because they were relatives of Jesus. Uh, and they lived uh, in time, until the time of the Emperor Trajan, who uh, reigned between 98 and 117. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Eusebius says they were martyred under Trajan. Uh, Eusebius also says that uh, a guy named Judah Kyriakos, who is a great-grandson of Jude, was bishop of Jerusalem in the 130s. So, so this is a place where we see uh, people who were believed to be blood relatives of Jesus remained in significant positions in the church, respected in the church into the second century. So, James, and James, and James, and Jude, and Jude, and Jude. <laughs>